we invite you to put yourself in the scene as you watch the drama, Daniel, A Lifetime of Faith, Part 1. King. General. We starved them out. But Jehoiak can still Negotiations refuse. don't concern you, General. But your incompetence does. Finish it! Or you'll not find me as forgiving as the gods. Yes, my king. This is what Jehovah of Armies says. Because you did not obey my words, all this land will be reduced to ruins. And this land and its inhabitants will have to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Daniel. Stay and play. I've got to go with Papa. When you come back, you want to play Noah's Ark? Sure. And who will you be? I'll be a lion. <laughs> mm. Then I'll be an elephant. Thanks. We have to go. Go? Go where? We don't live here anymore. Push him. Grab our bags. So we've just been watching some of the opening scenes from part one of Daniel, A Lifetime of Faith. At every Jehovah's Witness convention, there is some drama. In the pre-JW broadcasting era, these dramas were typically done with audio tapes. And let's say it was done in a football stadium or in a sports ground. People would dress up in fake beards and costumes and literally mime the words of the tape in front of the audience, usually depicting some Bible scene. Obviously, in the era of JW Broadcasting, or since around 2014, when the organisation has really started investing heavily in video production, these dramas are now done as effectively movies. We've had in previous conventions Hezekiah brought to life. We've had the story of Jonah. We've had a really disturbing depiction of the story of Josiah in which the governing body seemingly vicariously lived out the, what it would be like to preside over a caliphate and kill all non-believers. Last year's drama, of course, was the story of Nehemiah, and this year they're dealing with the story of Daniel. And I've had a bit to say about Daniel, but I just want to draw people's attention to the opening slide or the opening caption, 617 BCE seems to be the date they're giving to the surrender of Jehoiakim 
the fall of Jerusalem by the forces of Nebuchadnezzar before obviously Jerusalem later ended up being destroyed. It was besieged by Nebuchadnezzar and Zedekiah was installed as a puppet ruler by Nebuchadnezzar. This event did not happen in 617 BCE. So the film hasn't even begun <laughs> and already Jehovah's Witnesses are being fed a false narrative. It's simply incorrect. Historians and archaeologists do not support 617 BCE as the initial fall of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar and the installing of Zedekiah as a puppet ruler. Instead, this happened in 597 BCE. It's interesting that there's a 20-year difference between these dates because, of course, Jehovah's Witnesses famously point to 607 as being the year when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and its temple, which, of course, informs their prophecies regarding 1914 and the last days. In fact, their entire theology about the validity of their religion and its divine mandate centers around this idea that Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed in 607 BCE, when in fact that happened 20 years later in 587 BCE. So it's interesting that there's a 20-year difference here as well. They're saying that Nebuchadnezzar's initial siege of Jerusalem, in which Jehoiakim surrendered and Zedekiah was installed, happened in 617 BCE, when in fact it happened in 597 BCE, you can see what's happening. It's just that 20-year difference, isn't it? Jehovah's Witnesses, or the governing body specifically, think they know better than historians. And if historians say, actually, this happened in 597 BCE, because the governing body needs there to be a 20-year difference in order to support their theology and indeed the entire theological basis of their religion, they say, oh, no, no, we know better. So I just find it fascinating that the film has barely begun and already Jehovah's Witnesses are being presented with misinformation regarding history. That's before we even get to Daniel as a character. I recently had Richard Carrier on this channel uh, Richard is a Bible scholar. He has a lot to say on the subject of mythicism. In other words, the historicity of Jesus. You can check out our conversation here. Here's the thumbnail if Tibor is gracious. But it turns out Dr. Carrier also has a lot to say on Daniel as a book. And he wrote an article on his blog titled How We Know Daniel is a Forgery. Here is a screen grab from that article. And you, you might be looking at this article if you're, particularly if you're a believer and saying, oh, this is a ridiculous article. Of course, Daniel isn't a forgery. Well, if you actually read the article and read Dr. Carrier's arguments, you realize that this heading, this headline is not sensationalist. It's not clickbait. It's not just enraging believers for the sake of it. Daniel really is a forgery. That is the consensus of Bible scholars. And Richard Carriott goes to great lengths to explain how we know. It's not just a debate. <laughs> it's not like it's a theory. We know that the book of Daniel is a forgery. It was written to present a false narrative. And regarding the actual character, Daniel, I'll scroll down to the bottom because in his concluding comments, Dr. Carrier says, all evidence points to there never even having been such a Jewish prophet before the book of Daniel was fabricated in the 160s BC or for maybe some of its earlier chapters in the 4th century BC, although that remains less certain. Legends of such a prophet may have circulated in previous centuries 
evolving from the legendary Ugaritic Danel, just as Noah and Job are myths evolving from the likes of Jobab and Ut... <laughs> I'm going to have to pronounce this. Utnapishtim. Many of the tales in Daniel may derive from such oral myths, setting them now in a specific historical era that its authors did not actually know all that well, but wanted readers to believe was historically legitimate, resulting in embarrassing and otherwise inexplicable errors by which we are able to now detect the con. Yes, when you actually read the details in Daniel and compare them with what we know for a fact from our study of history and archaeology, we realise that whoever wrote the book of Daniel, and it certainly wasn't Daniel, whoever wrote it was making mistakes left, right and centre that you simply wouldn't make if you were Daniel, if you were someone who was a senior official in the courts of Babylon and who had seen firsthand things transpire, they make mistakes. And that's one of the main reasons why we know the book of Daniel to be a forgery. So I think it's important that as we watch these clips from this Daniel drama, and I've tried to spare you from watching the whole thing, I've tried to just select what for me are the most important, most significant moments from the drama. I think it's important that we keep this in the back of our minds in terms of some context here. What they're doing is they're creating a dramatization that's based on a made-up fictitious narrative. The book of Daniel is a forgery. We know this. So let's be clear, quite apart from that business about 617 BC, and Jehovah's Witnesses being fed pseudo-history right off the bat, quite apart from all of that, what's going to be depicted in this Bible drama is not history, it's fiction. Daniel, of the tribe of Judah. You will receive training in the house of the great king, Nebuchadnezzar. But this is my family. Princes and nobles belong in the palace. He's not a prince, he's just a boy. Please, I will go. If it's a servant, you see. No, I'm taking the boy. Daniel. Wait, can we say goodbye? Make it quick. Be strong, my son. Jehovah is with you. You have been chosen because you were wise. But you are lacking. You will learn our writing and our language. You will be given new names. And at the end of three years, you will serve the great king, Nebuchadnezzar. Today, you are foreigners. Tomorrow? <laughs> the gods willing. Babylonians.
So we see there Daniel being taken from his family, taken into Babylon, and informed that from this point forward he's to be considered a Babylonian, and he's going to be trained so that he can be of service to King Nebuchadnezzar. Nothing too out of the ordinary so far. Actually, I have to say that this particular drama, this year's drama, is a bit better than what we've seen in previous years, and that's not saying much, I know. But especially with some of the scenes that are to follow, we're just going to see a, a higher quality of production, certainly in terms of the visual effects, as you're going to see. I don't want to spoil too much. Is the acting on point? I think that the acting ability of the chap who's playing Daniel, basically the central characters, they seem to be of a higher caliber, but usually the quality of acting falls dramatically when we move to the peripheral characters in the drama. And we're seeing that here to some extent. But yes, it's exactly what you'd expect of a Bible drama. Fake beards, tunics. I mean, really, the costumes aren't that imaginative, are they? <laughs> you could literally just take the costumes straight out of any other Bible drama, whether it's the Hezekiah, the Nehemiah, the Jonah drama. You could just switch them and no one would really know the difference, would they? Those Babylonian soldiers just running around in tunics. Oh, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> There's not much imagination on show, is there? But what do you really expect? It's exactly what we get year after year after year not so interesting stories being given the Hollywood treatment simply because they serve the narrative of the organization. And as this drama unfolds, we're going to see another example of that. Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to identify with Daniel's character and identify with the demands that are made of him by a worldly king. <laughs> 